This video will review some of the basic information necessary to conduct a hearing screening. It is important to recognize that a hearing screening does not diagnose a hearing loss. It identifies children at risk for hearing loss who need further testing. In order to diagnose a hearing loss, comprehensive audiological assessment must take place and it must be conducted by an audiologist. Studies of newborns indicate that two to four babies per 1,000 are born with hearing loss in the United States. Hearing loss can also develop as children get older. A hearing loss present in childhood can affect speech, language, educational, and psychosocial development. Studies have also shown that when a hearing loss is identified and treated early, the negative impact on a child's development is reduced. Programs focused on finding and treating hearing loss consist of three parts. Part one, hearing screening. This identifies children suspected of having hearing loss. Part two, diagnosis. This involves either confirming or ruling out hearing loss. And part three, treatment. This involves medical and or audiological treatment to meet the needs of the child with hearing loss. This video will discuss the first step in the process, hearing screening. There are a few vocabulary terms about ears and hearing loss that you should know as a hearing screener. Hearing loss can be congenital, which means it is present at birth, or acquired, which means it develops after the child is born. Hearing loss can be bilateral, present in both ears, or unilateral, present in one ear. And hearing loss can be stable, meaning it does not change over time, progressive, meaning it becomes worse, or it can be fluctuating, meaning the child's hearing loss will vary over time. The ear is a complex organ used to hear sounds. It takes sound waves from the air and transforms them into signals that the brain can understand. The ear has three main parts, the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The outer ear is the part of the ear that you can see and it includes the pinna and the ear canal. Sound waves travel down the ear canal toward the eardrum. The middle ear is an air-filled cavity that begins at the eardrum, or tympanic membrane, which is a thin membrane stretched tightly across the ear canal. When sound waves reach the eardrum, the eardrum vibrates a chain of bones and the vibration is transmitted to the inner ear. The cochlea of the inner ear is a fluid-filled tube coiled like a snail shell and lined with thousands of tiny hair cells. Each movement of the middle ear bones creates a fluid wave which causes the hairs to convert the motion to electrical energy that travels to the brain and is interpreted as sound. There are three categories of hearing loss. They are conductive, sensory neural, and mixed. A conductive hearing loss is a loss that occurs because of a problem in the outer or middle ear. In many cases, a conductive hearing loss can be medically or surgically treated. Causes of conductive hearing loss include otitis media, commonly called middle ear infection, earwax impaction, otitis externa, or swimmer's ear, and a foreign body in the ear canal. A sensory neural hearing loss is caused because of a problem in the inner ear or auditory nerve. This loss is usually permanent and may require audiological and or surgical treatment with hearing aids, cochlear implants, or other technology. Examples of causes of sensory neural hearing loss include hereditary hearing loss, complications during pregnancy or delivery, childhood illness such as meningitis, head injury, and noise exposure. A mixed hearing loss includes both a conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. Two important characteristics of sound are frequency, which we perceive as pitch, and intensity, which we perceive as loudness. A hearing screener needs to control both frequency and intensity during hearing screening. The frequency range for normal ears is 20 to 20,000 cycles per second, or hertz. The range of sounds for our daily listening needs is limited to a smaller frequency range, specifically frequencies of 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 hertz are critical for hearing and understanding speech sounds. A child with a hearing loss in this frequency range has a distinct disadvantage compared with children who have normal hearing. A child with hearing loss may hear some sounds but not understand speech. In other words, the child may hear someone speaking but have difficulty understanding what is said. The normal ear can perceive very soft sounds to very loud sounds. The intensity range is from about 0 decibels to over 100 decibels. A child with a hearing loss loses the ability to hear soft, moderate, and sometimes even loud sounds depending on the degree of hearing loss. The audiogram is a graphical representation of hearing ability. Frequency, or pitch, is located along the top of the graph from low to high. 
intensity, or loudness, is located along the side of the graph from low, quiet, to high, loud. A lawnmower is a low frequency sound, but it is very loud. If we were to graph the sound of a lawnmower on an audiogram, it would appear here. A bird whistle has a high frequency sound, but it is very quiet. The sound of the bird would appear on the audiogram here. The sounds of speech vary from low to high pitch and from soft to moderate loudness. The speech sounds fall within this envelope. Low pitched sounds like mmm and n would be located in one part of the envelope and high pitched sounds like sh and s would be located in another part. Children with normal hearing can hear all of the speech sounds. Children with a mild or moderate hearing loss may hear some of the sounds, but not others. To them, speech may sound muffled and difficult to understand. Children with more severe hearing loss may not be able to hear any of the sounds of speech without hearing aids or other amplification devices. The sounds that a child with hearing loss perceives will vary depending upon the degree and type of hearing loss. A computer simulated hearing loss is sometimes used to demonstrate to parents and teachers how speech sounds when parts of the signal are missing. Here is an example of speech that has been filtered so some of the high frequencies are missing. The sun is a star and it is part of our solar system. One can see the sun from Earth and it moves in the sky throughout the day. In the morning, one will see the sunrise and in the evening, one will see the sunset. Now here is the same speech example, but with all of the filtered parts put back in. The sun is a star and it is part of our solar system. One can see the sun from Earth, and it moves in the sky throughout the day. In the morning, one will see the sunrise, and in the evening, one will see the sunset. One of the most important parts of a hearing screening program is the selection of a screening room. If possible, it is best to identify and reserve a quiet screening location prior to the day of screening. Hearing screeners should stress that if the room is not quiet enough, the screening will have to be rescheduled. The hearing screening must take place in a quiet location away from the main flow of traffic. Ask the school nurse or other school staff for help in identifying an appropriate room. If the screening occurs in a room that is too noisy, a large number of students with normal hearing will not pass. If a quiet room cannot be located, it may be necessary to reschedule the screening. It is never acceptable to raise the intensity of the tone to compensate for a noisy environment. Possible quiet locations include vacant classrooms, the nurse's office, the library or media center, or other quiet rooms. The setup of the screening room will vary depending on the size of the room, the number of children to be screened, and the number of screeners. Here is an example of a small screening room set up with one screener and one child. Here is a slightly larger room. It is generally faster to have several children in the room so they can all receive instructions at the same time, but it may be difficult for young children to sit quietly. If a second person is available to assist, children can be lined up along a hallway or seated in a nearby room. The assistant is responsible for keeping the children quiet and may help with the flow of traffic to and from the classroom and into the screening room. If an entire class is scheduled at the same time, the classroom teacher may be able to supervise the children who are waiting and also help to control the flow of children into and out of the screening room. Here is an example of a larger room with three screeners and three children. Although many children can be screened quickly with this setup, it requires one large room or several smaller rooms plus multiple screeners at one location. It also requires at least one person to control the noise level in the waiting area and to assist with the flow of students to and from the screening room. In addition, the screeners need to coordinate their actions so that instructions occur for a group of students and the screenings start and end at about the same time, so no one is talking during the screening. If a child does not understand the directions, the screener will have to take the child out of the room to re-instruct or wait until the other screeners are finished. An audiometer is an electronic instrument designed to measure hearing. Avoid dropping or banging the audiometer as it is easily damaged. It should be stored at temperatures above freezing and below 90 degrees and should not be left in a car during extreme weather conditions. The cords should be stored free of tangles and twists. When preparing the audiometer for a hearing screening, first plug the instrument into a wall outlet. Take care not to create a tripping hazard by running the electrical cord between the door and the testing table. 
be sure to set up the chair for the children in a position that will have them facing away from the audiometer. Wash your hands or use hand sanitizer prior to the listening check and between each screening. Clean the earphone cushions prior to each screening and between each child using an alcohol-free wipe designed to be used on rubber, as alcohol-based cleaners will damage the rubber cushions over time. Be careful to keep moisture away from the diaphragm of the earphone. That's the little hole in the center of the earphone. Conduct a listening check by following these steps. Turn the power switch to on. Leave the tone mode at norm off. This means the tone will not sound until the button is pressed. For some audiometers, the right and left ear buttons are marked. For others, the output for the right ear is red, red for right, and the output for the left ear is blue. The tone level or tone button produces a tone when pressed. There are two dials. One controls the frequency or pitch of the sound and is measured in hertz, abbreviated capital H, lowercase z. The other controls the intensity or loudness of the sound and is measured in decibels, abbreviated lowercase d, capital B. Perform a listening and visual check every time the equipment is turned on using the following steps. Inspect the cords and the headset for any visible damage. Be sure they are correctly connected to the audiometer. Frayed cords should not be used. Put the headset on. Check your own hearing at 20 dB at 1000 Hz in the right ear. Then check 2000 Hz and 4000 Hz, also at 20 dB. Then check the left ear, starting at 4000 Hz, then 2000 Hz, and finally 1000 Hz, keeping the intensity level at 20 dB. If you have normal hearing and you cannot hear all of the tones, either the equipment is not working or the background noise level is too high. Retest the equipment in a quieter room to determine if the problem is with the equipment or with the noise. With the headset on, push the tone button and move the cords, listening for static or a loose connection. Sit where the children will sit and rest your head and arms in positions you expect the children to sit. Listen for sounds conveyed through the table, elbows resting on the table, head on hands, and also listen for sounds from the chair, head back against the chair rest, to see if vibration from the room may interfere with the test. The audiometer is in need of repair if the tone does not sound normal, if no sound is produced when the tone switch is pressed, if static is heard, if the earphones do not remain in proper position over the ears, if a dial or switch does not function, if indicator lights do not glow, and if the cords are frayed or the earphone cushions are ripped. In addition to daily listening checks, it is important that the equipment be calibrated by a professional testing facility at least once per year. The date of the last calibration check should appear on the audiometer or be available from the calibration file from the school system or health department. If you do not have normal hearing, then ask an adult with normal hearing to help you do a brief listening check. First, do a hearing screening on the listener. Then put on a continuous tone and ask the listener to let you know if they hear any unusual sounds as you move the cords. There are many different styles of portable audiometer, but they all include the same basic features. On this audiometer, the tone button is here, the frequency dial is here, and the intensity dial is here. On this audiometer, the tone button is here, the frequency dial is here, and the intensity dial is here. On some audiometers, you may need to select right and left with a toggle switch. There are some children who should not be screened. If the child has hearing aids or cochlear implants, the child should not be screened. If the child has a permanent hearing loss that has already been diagnosed, the child should not be screened. If the examiner notices fluid draining from the ear, or the child complains of pain in the ears, or the screener notices head lice, the child should be referred to the school nurse and not screened. Hearing screeners should inspect the ears prior to the screening and if they notice foreign objects in the ear canal or swelling or redness of the ear canal, the child should be referred to the school nurse and not screened. If the child has cotton balls, earplugs, or iPod type earphones in their ears, they should be removed. For cotton balls, first ask the child if the cotton balls are due to an ear infection. For earphones, check to see if they are part of an amplification system for hearing loss. Ask students to remove eyeglasses, large hair clips, larger dangling earrings, or headbands. 
Small earrings should not be a barrier to a snug fit. You only need to remove things that will interfere with the test. Use the following instructions to prepare students for the hearing screening. I am going to put these earphones on your ears. Show them the earphones. You are going to hear some beeps in your right ear and then in your left ear. Raise your hand every time you hear a beep, even if it is very, very soft. Put your hand down when the beep goes away. Give the student frequent praise for listening carefully. If a student does not seem to understand the directions, remove the headset and repeat the instructions. If the directions are not understood after repeat instruction, remove the headset and allow the child to return to class. For young children, practice the hand raise before the earphones are placed and consider responses other than a hand raise if necessary. Here are a few examples. If you do a demonstration by presenting a loud tone from the earphones, such as 100 dB, you need to be close enough for all of the children to hear the tone, about one to three feet, and you must always be sure to turn the intensity down before placing the earphones on the child, as a 100 dB tone can be painfully loud right next to the child's ear. From in front of the child, place the red earphone on the right ear and the blue earphone on the left ear. Note that the right, red, earphone is held in the examiner's left hand so that it ends up on the child's right ear. Tighten the earphones onto the ears by adjusting the band on the headset so there is a snug fit over the ears and the earphones do not slide down off the ears. Do not permit the students to place their own earphones. The earphones should be placed so the diaphragm of the earphone, the hole in the center, is directly over the ear canal. If necessary, push hair behind the ears before placing the earphones. Follow these procedures for the screening. Be sure the child cannot see the examiner pressing the button, either directly or via a mirror or reflective glass. Always screen the right ear first. With the intensity dial set to 20 dB and the frequency dial set at 1000 Hz, present the tone for two to three seconds and then release. Turn the frequency dial to 2000 Hz, present the tone for two to three seconds, and then release. Turn the frequency dial to 4000 Hz, Present the tone for two to three seconds, and then release. Change the selector to the left ear. With the intensity dial still at 20 dB, present tones at 4000 Hz, 2000 Hz, and 1000 Hz in the left ear. After each screening, the screener should mark the child's name, the date, the result of the screening, and any other information required by the school system and or health department. If the student responds to all of the tones in both ears, they have passed the screening. If the student fails to respond to any of the tones, they have failed the screening. Even if they miss only one tone, they have failed the screening. Mark refer on the response form if they do not respond to all of the tones. This video reviewed basic pure tone hearing screening procedures in the schools. It is important to remember that a hearing screening identifies children at risk for hearing loss. In order to confirm a hearing loss, follow-up diagnostic testing must be conducted. If a hearing loss is confirmed by the follow-up diagnostic testing, then medical and surgical intervention can be done by a physician and audiological intervention can be done by an audiologist.